Nature's Archive Podcast, a Jumpstart Nature production. Hey, you're in for a treat today. It's like two episodes in one. My guest today is Alessandra Valdez, a botanist working on her PhD in plant physiology in Cornell University's Ecology and Evolutionary Biology Department. Alessandra has a background studying invasive species and is the creator and host of the Happy Botanist podcast. Today's wide-ranging discussion touches on everything from studying plants' response to climate change through looking at carbon-13 isotopes, to invasive species including the hemlock woolly adelgid, and the surprising behaviors of an invasive grass called Johnson grass. They're both really fascinating. And we also discuss Alessandra's work in science communication and her podcast, The Happy Botanist. As you know, my Jumpstart Nature organization seeks to amplify great work being done by others, and after meeting Alessandra and learning about her work and her vision, I felt that she really fit the bill. So the last 30 minutes of today's episode is a reshare of one of her episodes with Dr. Daniel Katz. Dr. Katz studies airborne pollen, specifically allergenic pollen. If you've ever wondered why some pollen causes so much havoc, or if those pollen forecasts you sometimes see on the local weather are accurate, stay tuned to learn more. So without further delay, my interview with Alessandra Valdez and later her discussion with Dr. Katz. Alessandra, thank you so much for joining me here today. Yeah, I'm so glad to be here. This is awesome. So this is a, a maybe a little different style of episode for Nature's Archive than typical. And I'd say for a couple of months now, we've been collaborating and exchanging notes because you started a podcast of your own. And I've been interested in following along on your journey with your new podcast. I'm glad that we're making this real and I'm excited to be able to share one of your episodes to my audience. Yeah, this has honestly been so exciting as a new podcaster. It's great to have some podcasting mentors and it's been so nice to chat and talk about things that I don't normally talk about in my day to day. So yeah, this is a really exciting endeavor and it's been building. And I'm so glad we we're getting the chance to finally have a podcast exchange and share some episodes. Yeah, definitely. You're off to a great start as far as I can tell. And from what I've heard and seen, I'm looking forward to seeing how it continues to progress. But before we jump too far into that space, tell me a little bit about yourself. You're a PhD candidate right now. What are you studying? And we'll start there. So I'm actually not a PhD candidate yet. And now this okay. is a super complicated thing that not a lot of people really know the process behind. So technically, I'm still in my PhD student phase. Candidacy happens after your first exam. And since I just started off my PhD this past year, I'm in that PhD student phase until I take my candidacy exam, which is going to be at the end of my second year. But yeah, I started off, went to college, not really knowing exactly what I wanted to be at the end. I've always had a love for science. So I thought I'd go into the medical field because I thought that's a great way to practice science and be very involved with the day to days and loving our world and loving our people. And as I got into college and started taking some of those medical classes, I just found out it just, it wasn't for me. And there was this class that I started taking and it was an ecology-based class looking at some different tree species. And I just like fell in love with ecology. And it was one of those moments for me where I like turned around and I could just see how it was all kind of building up to this moment of like this, I don't know, epitome almost of finding out I wanted to become a botanist. So that's where my start comes from. But my love of nature has been something. I've always been a huge outdoors girl. And I grew up in the mountains in Pennsylvania and the surrounding trees. I, I just grew up in them and playing around them. So I think that's really where my botanical love started, but really solidified in my first year of college. I got my master's at Oklahoma State University this past June. And yeah, now I'm here doing my PhD at Cornell University. What is it specifically that you are studying? Right now, I'm in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, and I am in a lab that focuses on the use of application of a method called stable isotopes to basically answer a bunch of questions throughout the world. And how I plan to do that is I really am interested in one specific 
isotope called carbon-13. And I know that sounds really scary. Scary word, stable isotope, what is it? And I promise these are the isotopes that don't blow up. These are the ones that stay around for a long time. But basically with that, you can tell a lot about a type of plant science called plant physiology. And now plant physiology is basically the inner workings of a plant, how it's responding to different stimulus outside of it. So I'm really interested in what I like to call plants not dying and how they can not die. And basically just that barely staying alive point where it's like, are you dead yet? Are you sure? Like, <laughs> But with that, you can tell a lot from how the plants are responding to drought and focusing that in the framework of climate change. I'm going to tell you what an amazing coincidence because I am currently working on editing a discussion I had with uh, Dr. Lucy Kerhulis. She is a plant or forest physiologist at Cal Poly Humboldt. And we talked all about carbon-12 versus carbon-13 oh, and perfect. how she uses it. So this could be a quick introduction, and then we'll have a deep dive with Dr. Kerhulis next. What a coincidence. Like, <laughs> I could not have planned that if I wanted to. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. Yeah, it's all the rage right now in the plant physio world. Is we've, We're big carbon gals over here, gals and guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I learned a little bit from her about the type of machinery used to measure respiration of plants and like a bunch of different things that also go into the broader physiology, measuring physiological responses and things like that, which was all new to me and very exciting. Oh yeah, very exciting. We just got our brand new Lycor and I have been geeking out. <laughs> the, si the 6800 or the 6400? The 6800. Oh okay. no, <laughs> not the 64. The 68, of course. Wow. I'm very excited. I'm going to take a course with Lycor in the upcoming months and get fully trained on it. I've used a Lycor in the past, but it's a wonderful piece of equipment. Go Lycor. Hire me, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I guess listeners are going to have to tune in for the Lucy Kerhulis episode to learn about what the Lycor is and why that's so exciting. And why yeah, I'm super excited so for good. it too. <laughs> <laughs> so awesome. And you've started a podcast of your own. Tell me about that. Yeah. So I recently started the podcast. It's called The Happy Botanist, and it has been one of my absolute favorite passion projects. It's been in the works in my head for like two years now, but it officially launched this past October 2023. Can't believe it's already 2024. And basically the reason why I started this podcast is I, we talked a little bit about my experience and how I came into college, not really quite sure what I wanted to pursue and fell into this love for botany and ecology. And with that, I've started doing some mentorship work when I was in Oklahoma getting my master's. I had some undergraduate researchers who were all fantastic and amazing. And I saw so much similarities between me and them and basically them kind of dealing with and working through these same questions of like, well, what can I even do with the degree in botany? What can I even learn? Like, why is it even important? They just joined this project because a lot of them heard at one point they needed a research credit and it was a greenhouse-based project, so there was like a lot of hands-on experience. And they're like, oh, I like to garden with my grandma. And then I eventually had several students who ended up switching majors into plant ecology, regular ecology, general biology, and focusing more on the natural side of science because they found that love and passion for it too. And that whole experience was super rewarding. And I had this epiphany that this experience is not something that's unique to a lot of students of not sure what to do and what can I even do with a degree in ecology or a degree where I'm studying plants. So this podcast is really aimed towards allowing people, not just students, but to find that love for plants and really think about how plants relate to them in their everyday lives and just just celebrate plants and think about, I'm, I feel like in every episode, I'm like, they're just so cool. Like, I love plants. They're so neat. Like, <laughs> So it's a real shout out to just all of the different ways that you can study, interact with plants, with the main focus of it being on botany, ecology, sustainability, and conservation. Hey, nature enthusiast. Do you want to be part of something bigger? 
Well, we're building a movement at Jumpstart Nature, and we've just added some new volunteers to help with our podcast and website. But this means our costs are going up too. I need to purchase software licenses to give them access to the production tools we use. For example, one media editing license costs $21 a month. And this is where you come in. Please consider supporting our mission by contributing to Jumpstart Nature through our Patreon or direct contributions, or even purchasing some logo merch. Check out all these options at jumpstartnature.com slash donate, also linked in the show notes. Not ready to make a financial contribution? Then please share this episode with three friends. Sharing what we do is actually one of the very best ways you can help us. Thank you all for your continued support. I know we've talked a little bit too about the science communication side of all of this, and that seems to also be a passion of yours to bring effective communication to the table. So tell me a little bit about the format of your podcast and how you apply some of those science communication principles to it. Yeah. So for those that aren't super familiar with science communication or lovingly said SciComm, um, basically scientists aren't actually humans, I think we've determined, <laughs> and that we cannot communicate with the general public. As a broad statement, there's a lot of papers that get circulated around with some really just fascinating science, but they don't really get sen- circulated other than through our very specific niche groups. And maybe once in a while, an article will pop up and make some big impact in several forms of popular science that maybe you'll see through science magazines, Instagram, TikTok, all of that kind of stuff. But basically what science communication is trying to bridge that gap and make this a lot more accessible and understanding understandable for people who aren't directly in the science every day in the lab in the field world, as I'm expecting many of these listeners probably have some form of SciComm that maybe they're already a part of or joined, like naturalist groups, as well as just reading popular science, or even science fiction has a lot of great SciComm themes in there too. Basically, how my episodes are typically set up, I have two episodes a month as of right now, and the first episode being like a 10 10 to 20 minute episode, which is basically like a science blast of a bunch of really cool things that groups of plants can do or problems within the plant communities and helping people better understand the roles that plants play. And then my other episodes are, I call them happy hours. And I sit down with a fellow scientist, a fellow botanist, and we talk about a bunch of different things. We have a a wide range of happy hours, but basically we're talking plants over drinking some botanical drinks. And it's a great way to learn more about other types of research that other people are done. As I've said before, I'm a physiologist, so that means I'm really interested in those plants' inner workings. So branching out and seeing how different people study and interact with plants, I think is something that is really interesting and a great way to get more than just my very boxed in perspective. But yeah, so trying to spread the word of science. (laughs) I like how you positioned it, that scientists apparently aren't humans because they can't communicate. And that's, I see more and more focus on science communication and some of the rigid boundaries that maybe had been set in the past in terms of how stories are told, how narratives are constructed. They seem to be, this is a positive, but like like breaking down a little bit, those boundaries are breaking down and people are, are stretching a little bit more to focus on the communications. I think work by people like yourself helps to elevate that perspective. It's just not all about the getting in the weeds of the science. It's about <laughs> showing why it's important. And here you go. Throughout your academic career, You mentioned you were at Oklahoma State, you got a master's, you've been involved in a number of different projects. So are there any favorite ones that you'd like to share with the audience today that they may also find interesting? Yeah, one of my absolute favorite projects was one of the first projects that I originally got involved in. And it was a project studying a microscopic bug called the hemlock woolly adelgid. And if you live on the East Coast of the United States, you might be familiar with this. I don't know if you've done any topics or anything on the hemlock woolly adelgid yet. But basic, oh, they're so cool. (laughs) Well, they're horrible. But (laughs) (laughs) so they're um, these microscopic bugs and they love these hemlock trees. They are non, 
native. They are an invasive bug that came over by mistake. They got contaminated with, I think it was shipping, but double check me on that one. But basically, this bug came over to the U.S., uh, found its way, and started burrowing within these hemlocks. And they're so small, you can't even see. And they're called woolly adelgids because they basically create this, like, fuzzy-looking slime. And I know it sounds really gross, but it's very small. But basically, they're causing a mass extinction, almost, of these hemlock trees, which is a huge part of our ecosystems here on the U.S. East Coast. And especially in Pennsylvania, where I grew up. And I really found this project extremely important because not only did I see these trees being really affected by this non-native organism and really disturbing the ecosystems around it, but I also, these were the trees that I grew up with before I could even identify a single plant species. I would see these trees everywhere. And then as I learned about this hemlock woolly adelgid and all of these problems that it was causing, it it was really interesting to see. I could see almost in live time the shifts in tree communities within my own hometown and around my own local streams that I grew up with. That was a project that really got me excited about botany. And there's a lot of work being done on ways to stop the hemlock woolly adelgids, keep the spread to a minimum to help with these hemlock trees. So hopefully they won't go on extinct. I don't think they're on the endangered list yet, but they're definitely in decline here. And it's one of those things that you can see it's really happening in live time. So that kind of led towards my master's. I had done a couple other projects on invasive species work. And then my master's was all on invasive species an invasive species in the Southwest U.S. in Oklahoma. And Basically, there's this grass called Johnson grass, highly prolific, really snuffs out almost every other plant around it. It's also allelopathic, which means that it produces these chemicals into the soil that say nothing else can grow here but me. It's pretty nasty stuff. And basically with that project, we were trying to find ways to help minimize its impact and help managers be able to help manage it. And it turned out, and now this isn't published work yet, so maybe I shouldn't be saying too much, but what we found is we are trying to, with increased drought, especially in areas like Oklahoma and Texas where it's super prolific, one of the main ways that we manage it right now is clipping, mowing, grazing, basically getting it out of the ground type of thought process. And um, when there's actually drought present, you would think that because there's drought and because there's this plant and it's being clipped and it's saying, I- I'm getting hurt, I'm getting hurt, maybe I'll just die. It's not worth being alive right now <laughs> or here at least. But we actually found that when there was drought and we were doing this management on it of clipping it, we actually found that it was growing better. It was almost growing in some cases double as much as what it was if we just left it alone. But it was a really effective strategy when there was a lot of water around and that it was like a normal management strategy. So physical removal management, which is clipping, mowing, grazing, getting it out of the ground, is effective when there was not drought present. But when there was, it actually kind of helped the plant in a sense. Wow. Where does Johnson grass grow naturally? It's so there's a couple of different places they think it originated from. I, so it's really big in like Southeast Asia, but basically uh, a farmer, I think his name was Colonel Johnson. And so it was named after him said, oh my gosh, the cows are going to love this. It's great. It's good foraging. It's really big and leafy and it grows like crazy. So they brought it over to the U.S. He planted it on his farm and Then they decided to plant it across the entire U.S. And then they're like, oh, my gosh, the cows don't even like it. And when it's in drought, it actually is toxic to cattle. And so that was a really great job on their part. (laughs) So always do your research before you go plant a species across the entire U.S. Yeah, and it's invasive in all 48 connected states right now. But it's really bad in Oklahoma, Texas, Arizona. Yeah, so many invasive plants came over for the purposes of cattle grazing or as an accidental side effect for cattle grazing, like mixed in accidentally. And that's amazing here in California. 
when we go out and we look at our hills, which get this in the summer, they're very golden looking. And it's because of all these annual grasses that have dried up and they have an annual life cycle and we have a summertime drought. So they grow in the springtime and, and then turn brown and you start looking at them and they're all invasives, like almost all of them. And so there's a major problem in much of the U S and the West and here in California in particular with invasive grasses and them crowding out the native plants that like all of our insects and everything else depend on. So it's interesting study. It's disappointing. And if I think if, if I could do, if I could snap my fingers and do one thing, it would be go back in time, you know, a, to see what the lands actually looked like before all this disturbance and then B to warn (laughs) against doing all of these things. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely I feel like as I've gotten more into the world and into the knowledge of invasive plants even though that's not my focus as much anymore, but it's still a big part of what makes me up as my science and my scientific path as one may say. It's not an uncommon story of seed contaminations of getting it accidentally shipped in packaging. And it's just because we didn't know originally. And as we become more and more global of a society, I think that there's definitely going to need to be a lot of prevention happening. As from my own research, I've found that it is very hard to backpedal in a sense and trying to get rid of the species. But that is up for debate along a lot of scientists and mm-hmm. on where the focus should be. Yeah. I- but yeah, not an uncommon story. <laughs> Just not to belabor the invasive species aspect of all of this too much, but I've been playing around with a Jumpstart Nature podcast idea, which is those are more narrative podcasts and one being about invasive species. And there's this track record that we have from chestnut blight to emerald ash borer to apparently the hemlock, I better get the pronunciation right, adelgid? Yeah, hemlock woolly adelgids. That we keep repeating and then... I know some people that live, say, in New Zealand or in Australia, and they have very strict regulations on imports and inspecting shipping, and they don't even allow a lot of plants to be imported because with imported plants come all sorts of things <laughs> that, you know, w- yeah. from, from worms to bacteria to fungi to ants to whatever. It's an interesting comparison to look at a place like New Zealand and how they manage their ecosystems compared to how we do it here in the US. And when you start to think, what might this look like if you fast forward another 100 years and which one is the sustainable model? Yeah, yeah. Especially for places like New Zealand. And I can't say because I've never been to New Zealand, but islands and smaller countries and smaller land masses are at most risk especially since most of them have a ton of endemic species, which are types of species that are not found anywhere throughout the world. So they definitely have a lot to lose with the smaller size that you have. So I think that's it's awesome that programs like in New Zealand and Australia, and I definitely think that there's a lot to learn there that we can use to protect our larger North American land masses too. <laughs> yeah, they both had some dramatic lessons learned (laughs) as well (laughs) that adds to their story. The episode that we're sharing today from The Happy Botanist, it's about allergenic pollen. And I am just curious, like, how did you stumble upon that topic? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So it was just, it happened to be a friend of a friend kind of situation. So when you join a PhD program, Instead of having grade levels, they put you in what's called cohort, which basically just means this is the group of people who started with you and will finish around the same time as you. And so one of the girls in my cohort, she happened to be one of the first graduate students of Dr. Dan Katz. And she was telling me all about the amazing research that they were planning on doing and some of the projects he had done in the past. And it was so different to me because there's not a lot of research out there on allergenic pollen. And I found myself asking questions that I never even really considered before, like, well, what makes some pollen allergenic pollen and other pollens just fine for people? 
and really having that focus on the health and the impact of communities, of how plants and people can relate. Yeah, I just found it really fascinating. And so she was able to connect me with Dr. Katz, who is an amazing guy and an amazing researcher. And they just had their first field season, which is super exciting. And I know that lab is going to produce some really fantastic work out there. I was like, I have to get you on an episode. Let's find a time. And it worked out really well. And it's been an amazing time. Well, I enjoyed it. And that's partly why we're sharing it here today. Before we get into the standard questions that that we talked about, are, do you have any upcoming episodes that you want to shout out or tease or get people excited for? Yeah. So we have a really exciting episode coming out February 15th. It is another happy hour and his name is Seven Song and he is a herbal practitioner at a free clinic here in Ithaca. And he's just absolutely a- an amazing herbalist. But we focus the podcast, The Happy Hour, on plant taxonomy and understanding the importance of learning how to properly identify plants. So we've got that one coming up and that it's going to be, it was one of my favorite conversations so far, although I have loved them all. It's like he's, sometimes you hear herbalist and there may not be strong qualifications. It sounds like he's got a science background if you're getting into taxonomy and so forth. Yeah, yeah. That's why I really appreciated his perspective because he is focused through a science background, even though he isn't formally trained as a scientist, having that science foundation and really looking at health and wellness and using plants as medicine in a very clinical way. All right, great. We'll be looking forward to that. And it, and you told me about a mini series that you have coming up. What's that about? <laughs> Yeah, I'm doing a little bit of a mini series on plants perspectives. So it's going to be the next few episodes that are releasing on the first of each month focused on how plants perceive the world around them. So one just came out February 1st, the first one, which is on smell. And so we're going to talk a little bit about in the next coming ones topics, such as how plants perceive light and plants perceiving gravity and even how plants can respond to touch. So how plants can respond to external stimulus, quote unquote, make decisions with their decisionless, non-existent brains. This, that sounds amazing. That's something I've actually thought a lot about. I recently, well, it's now probably been a year. I read Ed Yong's book called An Immense World, which is about animal sensory systems and how, how different those processes are. And I've always thought, well, plants do the same thing and they're even more different. Like they have sensory systems and they respond and they create, they have a chemical response to certain conditions and they aren't so different from us. So this sounds really interesting and I'm looking forward to listening to it. Yeah, I think it'll be great. Okay. You're not going to get away without answering the standard questions that I like to ask all my guests. (laughs) So here we go. Thinking back, has there been any specific event, like maybe a wildlife encounter or a relationship with a mentor or a book or whatever that really stands out to you as escalating your care for the natural world? Yeah, that's a really good question. And maybe I'll have to steal that one too for my (laughs) happy hours. That's fine. (laughs) So I've been thinking a little bit about this question. And I think that for me, one of the main events Besides the project I talked a little bit about with the hemlock woolly adelgid, one of the main uh, moments in my life where I really feel like I was connected with plants just stems from my childhood. And that would be in the winter time, right before winter had come. So like late fall, early, early winter, when the trees were still had some leaves on them and they were starting to fall off, my dad and I would go outside and we would shake the trees trying to get the leaves to fall off because we want a winter to come faster. And that was our little tradition of, <laughs> of shaking trees. And so my whole family's uh, very avid skiers. My, my parents met skiing and everything. So we would try to get winter to hurry along and shake the trees. And that kind of, I think, just that experience of shaking trees and really thinking about how the leaves were falling and that seasonal change. I feel like that really just instilled this love of nature and really looking at just basically how 
the world responds to this, the different seasons and how life continues. And then I started asking questions like, well, are the trees dead because the leaves are gone or, but they're actually very alive. And just like learning more about that. And then I'd be running around with my little kid microscope, looking at all of the grass blades under the microscope. So it was one of those moments where I look back and I go, oh yeah, I was supposed to be a botanist. I yeah. Think. <laughs> That's really interesting that you had such a deep connection so early. And then if you could magically impart one ecological concept, or maybe it's plant physiological or something in that realm that would help the general public see the world as you see it, what would that be? I would really just want everyone to really just think about how they are interacting with their environment. We as humans have almost in a sense domesticated ourselves and we think of ourselves almost in a sense where it's separate. We are separate than nature, but we are actually a huge part of nature and really just thinking about, and maybe this isn't exactly the concept that you're looking for, but just thinking about ways like how we were talking about before with invasive species and just the causes and effects that we have on our environment and our day-to-days. And that could be something as simple as just having more plants, native plants in your backyard, or just taking some time to really appreciate and protect our natural spaces as something that I really find extremely useful in the sense of not only keeping our environment alive and thriving and having tons of biodiversity, but just also to have us as people just become happy botanists. And even if you're not a botanist per se, I always say you can be always be a casual botanist, going out, identifying some trees, thinking about how they relate to you and, and how plants are part of the environment that we all just love and live in. So many things there, at least in a good way, press my buttons. Like I couldn't agree more. I very often... I just want people to start looking and what's the way to start because I, there are a lot of these big organizations and their messaging is more about, we want to convert you to be an environmentalist and people don't, you know, run a marathon in one step and we need them to take the first step and the next step. And that's what you're talking about there. So yeah, very cool. I'm super excited to see where your journey goes. And hopefully we can continue to collaborate and support each other and get more people reconnected to nature. Yeah, I'm so excited. This is going to be so wonderful. And thanks everyone for listening in. I hope you enjoy the happy hour with uh, Dr. Dan Katz. And thank you so much for inviting me to do this. This is wonderful. All right. Thank you. I, I appreciate you and, and your work. And without additional delay, here is episode seven of The Happy Botanist with Dr. Daniel Katz. Hello, my fellow plant people. I am very excited to introduce to you today's happy hour guest, Dr. Dan Katz. He is an assistant professor in the School of Integrative Plant Science here at Cornell, and his lab is focused around addressing questions about plant-related public health issues. Welcome, Dr. Katz. Hey, thanks for having me. I brought in the botanical drink we're enjoying today. We have a Hendrix-based drink. Hendrix is made from juniper berries because it is a gin. Um, but would you like to tell us a little bit more about your experience with gin, maybe why you chose this happy hour drink of today? All right. I'm not going to tell you too much about my experiences with gin, but I will <laughs> tell you a little bit about junipers. Uh, and so... Um, Juniper berries, well, they're actually cones, but they look like berries, so we'll call them berries. They, uh, oh, I didn't ever realize that they're actually technically cones. Yeah, yeah. Oh, they're okay. from gymnosperms. Oh, okay. Uh, so it is technically uh, a cone, uh, mm. but it looks like a berry, so we call it a berry. Mm hmm uh, and so that is the source of, of gin. And it turns out that even the, the name gin comes from the, the word for juniper, and I think it's Dutch. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so here we are, uh, drinking juniper products uh, <laughs> happily. And the reason that I uh, was excited to have some gin is that is um, 
I'm working a lot with the juniper species right now. And on the wall behind me, you can see all of these uh, photos of some of these uh, juniper uh, cones. And so that is why I thought, might as well have the tie-in with some gin. Gotta, you might as well drink some of your study species, right? <laughs> I or think at you least have a to. closely related I, one. I think if it's drinkable, I think you have to at that point. But um, let the let the listeners know these pictures are absolutely stunning. And if I could post them um, on my webpage or have a link to them, I would love to to share them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> I will say that it's a lot easier to, you know, be eating or drinking your study organism when it's something like juniper. A little harder <laughs> if you're working with, I don't know, frogs or mosquitoes or whatever it is. I mean, they do make the like fried frog legs like down in Louisiana, but I I want to try them. I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, hey, um Maybe if you ever move beyond botany. Then, uh... <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I think if I think if I wasn't a botanist, I I would be a herpetologist. I've got a, a turtle at home and a and a soft spot for the herbs, but I still think plants are cooler. Sorry, herpetologist out there. <laughs> well, hey, same. There's a reason I study plants too. <laughs> awesome. Well, we're gonna go ahead and get right into some questions. Um, and I always like to start off these. Uh, happy hours with talking a little bit about how you classify yourself in the broad realm of botany and plant scientists. How do you classify yourself? Yeah, I usually call myself a plant ecologist, but honestly, I'll call myself three or four different things. Sometimes (laughs) I call myself an aerobiologist Mm -hmm. because I work a lot with um, things that are in the air, including um, pollen grains. And then sometimes I also dabble a little bit in health sciences. So I also am a little bit of an environmental health researcher, too. But my roots are in plant ecology. (laughs) Roots, very good pun. (laughs) I'm sorry. You're going to have to get used to it. There's going to be a lot of that today. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, So you work a lot with allergenic pollen. Um, Would you be able to explain what allergenic pollen is and how that's different than regular pollen? Or is it the same thing? Yeah, so pollen, it's the the male uh, gamete of plants, the reproductive uh, part of, of it. And so a lot of uh, so plants have all sorts of different strategies for getting um, of that male gamete around, and <laughs> and so pollen can be distributed by everything from bees to um, bats to all sorts of different things, ants. There's a ton of different mechanisms out there, but one of the common ones is being blown around by the wind. Now. Pollen itself isn't harmful to people. However, some people end up having immune systems which attack pollen. And what can then happen is uh, if somebody is exposed to pollen uh, that they're allergic to, their immune system mounts this vigorous uh, a defense, uh, which ends up making that person miserable. And so all of those symptoms, itchy eyes, running nose, um, post-nasal drip, and even really important things too, like um, uh, pollen can trigger asthma attacks, which have the potential to be fatal. And so even though the pollen itself is really no big deal on its own, the body's response for somebody who's sensitized it can be it can be downright dangerous. And so um, so that's kind of the, the gist of allergenic pollen. Now, some people are allergic to um, just a couple of types of pollen, and some people are allergic to a variety. And then um, there's a lot of people who aren't allergic to any at all. Uh, luckily, I fall in that camp myself. <laughs> it would Lucky be, you, that would be so hard. <laughs> It would be miserable. Can you imagine like walking around, interacting with these plants as they're releasing pollen if you were allergic? I have had colleagues who did that, and I would not wish that on anyone. Yes, it is definitely very tough. I couldn't imagine it. I worked with Johnson grass in my master's, and I had never been exposed to Johnson grass beforehand. And I get in there, and I start 
clipping it all up and, and getting in there and my arms are covered in hives. I like ended up having to like buy special gear because I was allergic to my study species. So no more Johnson grass for me, but <laughs> yeah, that that's was, terrible. That would have been tough. <laughs> now imagine if instead of just like being on your hands, it was just floating oh through the gosh. air and pervasive around uh, certain times of year. That is crazy. Yes. I had some some pretty nasty pollen allergies myself, and I've always wondered why I'm allergic to certain types of pollen, like ragweed is a big one for me. But when I moved out to Oklahoma, I wasn't experiencing pollen allergies as much, even though that there is just as much pollen around there, I, I think, I guess, but... Yeah, totally. And so what happens is it takes the body a little while to become sensitized to something. Mm. And so... What people often find when they move to a new place is they get uh, sometimes a couple of years before the body starts to cue in on mm. the local uh, allergens, and so it's sometimes called the honeymoon fa- the honeymoon phase. Oh. So you move to someplace new and it's great, and then after a little while, you're like, ah, uh oh, oh no, um, start <laughs> reacting to what's in the air. Oh, there. that's crazy! I didn't know that. Um, so when you see the things on, maybe. When you look at the web and look at the weather, they'll have like a pollen counter online. Does that, do you know anything about that? Does that take into account different types of pollen or just the most common um, allergen ones? Oh, yeah. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about that. <laughs> so, first of all, uh, most websites just have uh, that. Uh, there's maybe 10 different sources for this type of information out there on the internet. Um, a lot of them break it down into broader categories, weeds, grasses, and trees. Now, uh, of course, people can be allergic to specific types of trees. Um, mm. and, and so that's kind of the, or specific types of, or, uh, of weeds, which isn't even a very good category. Um, but so that's the first layer of how what you see on the internet may not be relevant for you as an allergy sufferer. The other part, and what is a little less widely known, is that a lot of these predictions that are made are based on very little data and do not actually have much validation. Mm. And so these are generally proprietary forecasts mm-hmm. that are... Um, often based on things entirely uh, different from, you know, oh, how you will react. So it might be mm. um, uh, derived from indices around allergy medication sales or mm. something like that, which may not actually track airborne pollen concentrations all that well. And so I actually have a project right now uh, assessing the accuracy of these commercial pollen forecasts. uh, And hopefully sometime soon, we'll be able to uh, give folks like you and your audience a quantitative answer to how good these predictions actually are. Um, From the preliminary data, I can tell you, not very. Mm. And so there's this big gap where we just, uh, people who have allergies uh, to pollen would really like to know how much they're exposed to. And to know things like, hey, is today a good day for me to go on a run? Or should I begin taking my allergy medication now so it reaches full efficacy before pollen concentrations increase? So there's all of this need for good forecasts. But what we have instead is either these commercial forecasts, which which have unverified accuracy, and then the other thing that we have is empirical measurements uh, that are collected by a variety of um, groups associated with the National Allergy Bureau, which mm. runs this uh, kind of loose pollen monitoring network in the United States. They have about 80 stations. Mm-hmm. Um, and they are doing fantastic work. These are folks who go out uh, at least several days a week and go up to the uh, the rooftop or wherever this pollen monitoring uh, site is and then count a lot of pollen 
manually. Manually? Wait, yeah. Like under the microscope or? Uh, exactly. Wow. And uh, go through all of these subtle diagnostic cues to distinguish between generally uh, uh, plant genera. Mm-hmm. It's a little bit of a tongue twister, isn't it? <laughs> generally plant genera. Uh, and But the problem is most people don't live right next to one of these pollen monitoring stations. Mm. And also when you're taking uh, empirical data like that, it's uh, what they are reporting out to the media is what happened over the previous 24 hours. Oh, so maybe not. It could a, be totally different. Yeah, it could be wow. totally different from one day to another. And so, if you're getting yesterday's measurements from a spot that might be uh, miles, if you're lucky, more likely tens or hundreds of miles away, it may not be very useful for you to make good decisions with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that's that's really interesting to think about because. We've talked a little bit on this podcast and in general about how physiology of a plant can change over time, um, especially with weather conditions. So I don't know if you know of any research or anything that with certain weather conditions, is there more likely to be more pollen, like let's say after a big rainstorm? Yeah. And so there's a ton of day-to-day variation caused by weather. Oh, uh, But there's also systemic variation caused by things like differences in temperature. Mm. And so cities often have something called an urban heat island, which means that there are these strong temperature gradients even within a city. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So (laughs) it's really uh, quite common for there to be uh, differences of uh, up to a few degrees Celsius between uh, a city center and the outskirts. And so... The difference of a few degrees Celsius, though, that's enough to shift the timing of when plants reproduce substantially. Mm. And so there could be differences of literally weeks in between when a plant is flowering at at the heart of a city where it's very warm, where there's all this impervious surface area versus on the outskirts of a city. And so there are these, so all of the the physiology of these plants interacting with the environment can lead to substantial variation, which means that what's being measured in one place isn't necessarily what's going to be in the air someplace else, even within the same city. That is crazy to think about. I've talked a little bit before about how light can affect tree times. Uh, In this instance, I discussed about how uh, artificial light can actually cause the tree to have leaf obsession at a different time for the fall time. But it's crazy to think about the climate, too, of the different areas could have a great impact on the the surrounding plants in that area and yeah. microclimates. I know that's a big thing that's rising in this field is the microclimates and looking at it at these smaller and smaller scales and how each little microclimate adds together to make a, a full area. Yeah, absolutely. And so all of this stuff, which is very academic and can be a little bit obscure sometimes, ends up being really important to somebody's quality of life Mm -hmm. and uh, can determine when they're exposed to some type of pollen and potentially what pollen types they're Mm -hmm. exposed to. So, uh, yeah, it turns out plant ecology is important. (laughs) Who would have thought? (laughs) Not us. (laughs) Um, So with urban and looking at urban settings, how do what trees are in that we are planting specifically for these urban areas, how do they play a role in public health, both beneficially and not beneficially? There are a ton of links in between uh, urban plants and public health. Now, some of them are around allergenic pollen, like I've been Mm -hmm. talking about, but there are also all sorts of other links too. Uh, One of the things that we see very consistently is that more 
trees in an area make it cooler. Mm. And this can happen through a few different mechanisms. It can happen through shading. Mm -hmm. Uh, You've sat underneath a tree in the middle of a hot summer, and it is so much cooler. Best place to be. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. And some of that is just not having the sunlight hit you. But it's also, it can happen through transpiration, the movement of uh, water out from plants. Mm -hmm. And so uh, that water can then uh, evaporate and cool down the whole area. And so between it all, um, neighborhoods with more trees end up being way cooler in the summer. Now, this is already really important in a lot of the United States and elsewhere, but think about how much more important this is going to be in the future as climates change and become warmer and as we get more heat waves. Uh, So Mm -hmm. that's another way in which plants can be really important to to public health. And uh, so... I'm excited about that. I have a new project uh, going on with some collaborators, including an engineer and a physician, a social Mm -hmm. scientist and a statistician, and uh, trying to to understand the effects of some of uh, the the cooling uh, provided by trees Mm -hmm. and uh, to see how we can actually use this knowledge to to make sure that our cities are... um, as well prepared as they can be to to keep people cool as climates warm. Yeah, it's a very big topic for right now. Climate change is one of the biggest concerns. How do you think that plants will respond in these city environments um, with it getting hotter and the microclimates in the cities potentially also getting hotter? That trade-off and that feedback between planting the plant for this protection and actually seeing that uh, effect afterwards? Yeah, uh, it's a good question. And we know little pieces of it. Uh, One of the things that comes out is that there's variation um, across plant life stages. If you look at what is important to a tree seedling, it's going to be very different Mm. to a mature tree. Um, That being said... uh, Plants are generally uh, pretty good at what they do. And Mm so uh, while there certainly um, may be some effects of temperature, uh, uh, what I would tend to be more concerned about than just um, changes in temperature by a couple of degrees, like a lot of these plants have broad distributional ranges Mm -hmm. and can survive across a range of temperatures, uh, as you can see with the the latitudinal ranges of a lot of these species. Um, However, drought can be really important. Mm -hmm. And so that is certainly something that uh, we'll be curious to see. Uh, There have been some big droughts uh, recently that have killed a lot of trees. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so there's some nice examples of that from the West Coast. Yeah. Uh, um, so we'll see. Uh, but the nice thing is that in a city, you can, when you're actively managing these plants, you have the potential to help them with what they need. Uh, Mm -hmm. You have the potential to irrigate them a little bit, to take Mm -hmm. good care of them in a way that, say, a tree seedling in a field or a forest is Mm -hmm. not exactly babied along. Yeah. (laughs) That, yes, definitely things to really think about when planting this. I don't know if you have any types of thoughts on types of trees that should be planted. Um, I know that there's a big push for natives being planted in this area, but looking at climate history, are there different types of species that people should be considered drought tolerant versus not? Um, What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a really good question. There are such large differences in between species in terms of what they can tolerate and then also in terms of what they do for us Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of public health or other things. Um, And so 
the question really becomes uh, how do we optimize across all of these different needs? Mm -hmm. And that's really hard in part because we don't have the all the information here. We don't necessarily know um, the importance of all of the ecosystem services or the ecosystem disservices that these trees provide. Mm -hmm. And so I'd argue that one of the, the really important things uh, in this field is to understand more about the ecosystem services and disservices provided by individual types of trees, individual species, mm -hmm. uh, or potentially even cultivars, uh, so that we can make the best uh, decision about what trees we plant where. Mm -hmm. And it, we should be thinking about uh, getting this right now, uh, because uh, as the, the cliche goes, um, uh, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago, and the next best <laughs> time is now. Uh, yeah, I, I know. It's a little cliche. It's I'm sure you've cliche. heard it on the podcast at least 20 times already in your <laughs> first few episodes. I actually know you're episodes. the first. <laughs> I believe it. Um, <laughs> but it's... Uh, it takes a while for these trees to grow and mature, and so um, we should be thinking about uh, the decisions that we make now are mm -hmm. going to stick with us for a long time, so we have some incentive to get it right. Yes. Yes, I've been seeing a lot of different research out there on not necessarily within urban situations, but trillion tree initiatives that many people want to partake in where they plant a bunch of trees to have some carbon offset, uh, offset balance and looking at things like that, but not necessarily looking into all of the research that comes into planting a tree. So you will go to one of these field sites where they planted trees five, 10 years ago for a trillion tree initiative project. Um, and it's just a, a field of dead uh, saplings, sadly. Um, so I, I agree that making the proper plans now and, and really thinking that through and, and working with scientists is a great way to make sure that these projects that have great initiative and great thoughts behind it can make sure that they're being sustainable and actually are going to be beneficial and not harmful. Yeah, absolutely. And it goes far beyond uh, these large uh, carbon-oriented projects. And uh, there are, uh, depending on the the city, um, something between perhaps uh, 10 or 20 percent and 100 percent of the trees that are there are planted. Um, and and this makes such a difference in people's quality of life. And the, the planting decisions that have been made have also... Um, have also contributed to some real inequities. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a lot of uh, literature uh, recently on the topic of um, inequity and tree cover among different neighborhoods. Mm. And there's some really strong evidence that places that were uh, redlined, uh, and just to explain for your listeners who haven't heard that term before, redlining was a practice of denying uh, people uh, loans for mortgages specifically in minority neighborhoods. Mm. And this systematic uh, discrimination occurred up until I think the uh, the late 1960s. Um, and so the, the neighborhoods that were redlined, in other words, minority neighborhoods where, uh, where people were um, uh, prevented from getting these uh, mortgage loans, um, have far lower tree cover today mm. and so therefore less access to some of the services that these trees provide wow that's i never even thought about that inequities that could even be within neighborhood and neighborhood and in, in certain areas yeah that's definitely very important things to think about especially as we're planning ahead for the future how to make sure that access to plants is is always accessible yeah, totally. And luckily, there's been some progress on that recently. The Inflation Reduction Act uh, it allocates $1.3 billion to community and urban forestry, and that money is especially going towards neighborhoods that have uh, have had less 
investment in them historically. Uh, of course, it's going to take a lot more than $1.3 billion <laughs> to uh, rectify some of these uh, um, patterns, but mm -hmm. um, it's a start. Yeah, got to start somewhere. <laughs> Awesome. And now I have been told a little hint by one of your grad students that you like to partake in urban foraging. Is that true? Oh, my God. I am so busted. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, I do. Uh, there's a, a few places where I, I tend to, to go. Um, and uh, let's see. This year, I got a lot of apples and grapes. Mm. Um Ithaca's great for that. <laughs> yeah, it is. Uh, mushrooms, too. Um, all sorts of uh, edible pieces of the landscape. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to people who want to start um, looking a little bit into urban foraging and how to do that safely? Get yourself a field guide. Mm -hmm. There are plenty out there that describe it. Um, don't just take a guess because you might be wrong. <laughs> Go for a field guide. Um, yeah. But it's amazing how much better your walks around the city are when you can be munching the whole time. <laughs> uh, it's amazing how much is out there that is both edible and even delicious. Oh, yes. <laughs> I've, I've dabbled a little bit into foraging myself, but I remember when I first started off, I was very nervous, double checking with all my friends before. Now I, I got a couple out there, but I, and I agree, starting with the field guide and there's some great YouTube and online resources for that um, of people who are doing similar stuff. So I, I think that that's awesome that urban foraging is something that a lot of people don't know about. And um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with or urban foraging, that's basically foraging, getting food from the land, uh, right where you live. Yeah, absolutely. Totally fun. Uh, totally cost effective. You do need to think a little bit about some of the the risks there as well, besides misidentification. And so um, knowing a little bit about the history of an area can help you do things like avoid um, high lead concentrations. Mm. Um, because lead is often an issue in cities. Uh, mm -hmm. It was in so much, including paint and uh, other things. And so um, if uh, this is especially important for somebody who um, may be considering uh, becoming pregnant. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yes. edu educate yourself a little bit before <laughs> you go and uh, go crazy. But if you're just eating a little bit here and there, it shouldn't be an issue. Yeah. Also, be careful of uh, crazy people up here grabbing off their land. <laughs> Make sure <those> too, right? <laughs> yeah, of course. Only you should only do this in public areas, and um, and we from... highly suggest that you only do this in public <laughs> in public land. <laughs> <laughs> I just do not know what you are implying here. <laughs> All right. Well, what advice would you give to either yourself as a young plant enthusiast or just kind of a good starting point for people who want to jump down the line and possibly become a, an allergenic pollen expert such as yourself? Oh, there's so much advice to give. Uh, but uh, And I say this because I have made so many mistakes. Um, but I think the, the <laughs> broadest piece of advice uh, would be to keep your sense of curiosity and wonder at the forefront. It's incredible how much is out there that is just so interesting and exciting. There are literally whole other worlds of, uh, of knowledge, and, and it's really neat. And I think it's it's so exciting to, to be able to find some of these things, uh, potentially even for the first time. And there's also such a need for more information about this. Mm -hmm. um, and so my advice would be to stay curious, find the things that excite you and pursue them. Uh, there's a need for more people who are doing work in this area. And so, uh, yeah. Go at it. Have fun. <laughs> Stay curious, fellow plant people out there. 
All right. Well, thank you so much. And I'd love to hear a little bit about what you have going on right now. What's exciting in your life? So I am going down to Texas to uh, have a field season uh, trying to understand things like when um, this particularly uh, nasty species of juniper down there uh, is releasing pollen and how much pollen it releases. And so it's going to be exciting to try and figure this out using everything from manual measurements to drone-based images all the way up to satellites. Mm. And it's exciting. I'm, yeah. I'm really looking forward to, um, to collecting some of this data and uh, answering some of these questions and ultimately being able to create these better predictions of how much pollen is in the air uh, over both space and time. That's awesome. That'll be really exciting. So is this one of your first field seasons since you've been here or? Well, um, it's not my first field season working on this, but it is the first uh, field season that um, that I'm going to be working with somebody else on mm. it. So I'm really excited to be working with Hannah Zonneville, who mm -hmm. is a PhD student who is working with me on these projects. And uh, so uh, we'll see. We'll see what we find. Yeah, awesome. Well, good luck with that and everyone working on the project as well. For those of you who are joining us today, thank you so much. Um, join us on Instagram at the Happy Botanist Podcast for more updates. And hey, if you liked this episode, make sure to follow. Hit that bell for new updates. As always, thanks to Cold Brew for our lovely song intro. Check him out. Thanks to Gabby Moffitt, the artist behind this cover. Both of these cool people are linked in the show notes. And Dan will also be linked in the show notes as well, too. Thank you so much for joining us today. And see you next time. Thanks for sticking through the entire episode. If you made it this far, I hope that it means that you enjoyed it. If so, please spread the word and share this episode with three friends or groups that you think would enjoy it too. As for today's episode, let me know. Did I miss anything? Was there a topic I should have covered? Let me know at podcast at jumpstartnature.com or DM me on any of my social accounts. I'll do my best to answer your questions. You can find me at Nature's Archive, one word, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I also share photography, nature stories, and much more on those accounts, so you can follow just to stay in touch, too. And despite being called crazy by numerous friends and colleagues, last year I left my tech career behind to start Jumpstart Nature, which Nature's Archive is now part of. For the sake of myself, my family, and the planet, I need to make this work, so please also consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash jumpstartnature. I offer some exclusive content and perks, and you can start donations as low as $4 a month. Lastly, please also check out our latest creation. It's the Jumpstart Nature podcast. We just completed our pilot season where each episode reveals an unseen, surprising, or misunderstood nature topic with the help of experts and our host, Griff Griffith. It's entertaining and inspiring and even reached number three on the Apple Nature podcast charts. There's much more on our roadmap, but we need your support. So check out jumpstartnature.com for more details. Thank you. Thank you.